names of the one true God. Barashit 8. El Shaddai, Bethel, Fear of Isaac, Penel, El Elohe Israel. Reading from the Darby translation, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all encouragement, who encouraged all of us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to encourage those who are in any tribulations, whatever, through the encouragement with which we ourselves are encouraged of God. As these lessons continue the names of the one true God, Yahweh, this will be evident that the names are in context with a covenant and some special event in a believer's life. Each of the names of God reveal a special aspect of the reality of the one true God and his nature. Without the revelation of the Holy Spirit, the names of God are only names without the full authority and power of the one true God. The names of God are more than just an identification for the one true God, Yahweh. Each name of God has to do with a relationship with the believer, a disciple of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, a true follower of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, whose life is integrated with Yeshua, Jesus, the Lord God, and the Holy Spirit. Each name of God is a divine expression of an attribute or a nature of the one true God, Yahweh. The translation of the Hebrew names into the English Bible leaves out the essence of the name and its meaning. The same is true for the names of God. Much of the essence and covenant meaning of a name of God is lost in many translations. The names of God are not just common names. The names of God are names that come out of a relationship with the one true God, Yahweh. When the Lord God made a covenant with a believer, a name came from that covenant. When a believer had a divine encounter with the one true God, Yahweh, usually a divine name would come forth. Sometimes the Lord God would speak as one with his specific name. The names of God are not magical names. The names of God are not magical names. The names of God are not magical names. The names of God are sacred names. They are holy names. They are righteous names of the one true God, Yahweh. The names of Yeshua, Jesus, the one true God, Holy Spirit, are not magical names that conjure something up. The names of Yeshua, Jesus, one true God, the Holy Spirit, do not manifest something from selfish desires, even if desire looks good. One thing you got to remember is that names of God are not magical names. The names of God, of the one true God, are sacred names. They are holy names. They are righteous names of the one true God, Yahweh. They are his sacred, righteous names. Each one of them names. Each names of God is a divine expression of an attribute or a nature of the one true God, Yahweh. The translation of the Hebrew names into the English Bible leaves out the essence of the name and its meaning. The same is true for the names of God. Much of the essence and covenant meaning of a name of God is lost in many translations. It's a divine expression of an attribute or a nature of the one true God, Yahweh. The translation of the Hebrew names into the English Bible leaves a lot of the essence out of the names and a lot of the meanings out of the names because people don't uh, go and dig up the Hebrew meanings. Translations of the Hebrew names into the English Bible leaves out the essence of the name and its meanings. The same is true for the names of God. Much of the essence and covenant meanings of the names of God is lost in many translations. An example is like the prophet Isaiah's name. Isaiah's name in ancient Hebrew is very divine, has a very divine meaning, and is a reference to the saving redemption of the Lord our God. Hallelujah. Isaiah's name in Hebrew is Yasha Yahu. The first part of Isaiah's name, Yasha, which 
in Hebrew means salvation or saves. <coughs> Yahweh is the name of the Lord God, shortened. Therefore, the save or salvation of Yahweh. The U is a suffix for R. Therefore, the Hebrew name of Isaiah would mean salvation of our Lord or salvation of Yahweh. Hallelujah. Isaiah's name is a good example of how English words do not convey the essence of a Hebrew name. Each of the names of God are sacred names and should be held in reverence above all the other names. <clears throat> Many times believers use the names of God as, as magical names that they have power to do what they want more than do the will of God. The names of God are not magical names. They do not do whatever you ask unless you have that kind of relationship with them and what you're asking is according to God's will and not your will. These names of the one true God are sacred names. They are holy names of the one true God. The names of God have power only when there's a living, personal, intimate relationship with that one true God. Hallelujah, Yahweh. And that person with that covenant relationship is present and invoking the name of God. The name of God. Hallelujah. The names of God are not magical names. The names of God are not magical names. The names of God are not magical names. The names of God are sacred names. They are holy names. They are righteous names of the one true God, Yahweh. The names of God and the title names deserve the highest honor and the highest respect. The lack thereof may constitute a misuse of the name of God. The one true God himself does not take the misuse of of the names of God lightly. God will punish whoever misuses his name or names. The names of God and the titles of God deserve the highest honor and the highest respect. So when you use names of God as magical names, you are not honoring and respecting that name or the person who, uh, who that name is about. Hallelujah. The lack thereof may constitute a misuse of the names of God. Hallelujah. May constitute a misuse of that names of God. And constitute that misuse of the names of God. God does not take lightly, and he will punish whoever misuses his name or names. So many people out there today is misusing his names, and they misuse it in the wrong way. And many believers, they try to and they misuse the names of God because they do not understand and they have not been taught properly, hallelujah, in the names of God. So they are making mistakes. Many believers speak the names of God with their lips and without having that revelation of the name from the Holy Spirit. Only one of the believer has a living, personal, intimate relationship does that revelation of that name come from God along with what is associated with that name. Hallelujah. The man of God and the covenant names of God, the names of God, excuse me, the name of God and the covenant names of God become a living reality. When they become a living reality for the believer, for the revelation of that name, of the names of God, it takes on a living reality of the name of God. And when you have that living reality of the name of God, then when you invoke the name of God, it comes to pass. What do you want? What that name represents. How are you? The power and authority of God and the relationship that name has to be present. Hallelujah. Now, like the word God. God is a generic name. Like tree. Tree is a generic name. Now, in our yard, we have several different types of trees. We have a maple tree, a redbud tree, an oak tree. And, uh, couple other trees <clears throat> so if I was just to say tree a tree in our yard you wouldn't know what tree I was talking about y'all you would know that was a tree I would if, to be specific I would have say the maple tree a maple tree a red bud tree an oak tree when I say it that way then you know 
who I'm, what tree I'm speaking about. The same is for a believer. When he has used the word God when speaking to an unbeliever or non-believer, because sometimes the person listening is not a believer. They do not know your God. They may be worshiping some other God. They may be a Hindu worshiping the sun. They may be a Muslim worshiping Allah. They may be <coughs> some other religion worshiping some other God. Some religion has thousands of gods. Some religion has a few gods. Some religion only have one God. Some religion have two or three. Christianity has one true God. That's God Almighty and His Son. We worship Him. Jesus as the Son of God, the one true God, and the Holy Spirit. Those are the three that operate as our God. Hallelujah. Isaac called his wife, Rebecca, was listening. After listening to his wife, Rebecca, Isaac called for Jacob. Now this was when, what happened just before this was Jacob went in and got the blessing of the first son from Isaac. He deceived him. But that was by God's instruction because if you read closely you'll find out that Jacob realized that was God who initiated that and not Jacob. All right. After listening to his wife Rebecca, Isaac called for Jacob and instructed him not to marry Canaanite women, but go to his uncle's house in Padaharam and take a wife from Laban's daughters. Before Jacob left, Isaac blessed Jacob using the name of God, El Shaddai. That's a very important name. Hallelujah. Now what's interesting about, the, <coughs> about this is that if Isaac, if Jacob was in hot water with Isaac, Isaac would not have blessed him with the Abrahamic blessing that he received. Hallelujah. Because you need to read this. It's in Genesis chapter 26, verse 35, and also in Genesis chapter 27, 41. Scripture reading. Genesis chapter 26, verse 35. Genesis chapter 27, verse 41 through 28, 9. This is 28, verse 1. So Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him and commanded him, Do not marry Canaanite women. Go at once to Badam Aran, to the house of your mother's father, Bethel. Take a wife for yourself from there, from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham, so that you may take possession of the land where you are now living as an alien, in the land that God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way, and he went to Padan Haram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Armenian, hid the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob and Esau. Okay, now see right there, if you was, that's, if, when you read the scriptures correctly, you'll find out that's what, Isaac did. And when Isaac blessed him like that, he put the, if, if Jacob <coughs> was still in it, was in his father's hot, was in hot water with his father by taking the firstborn blessing from Esau, he would have, God would not allowed Isaac to bless Jacob. Okay? Shaddai. See, Isaac used the word El Shaddai. Now, sh compound word El Shaddai. And Shaddai here is who is sufficient and most powerful, the Almighty. All right, in the Kamash, about our six, Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, El Shaddai. This name depicts God literally as Shaddai, who is sufficient in granting his mercies and who has sufficient power to give whatever is necessary. Shaddai. Shem Dalat Yod, Strong number 7706, who suffices, most powerful, almighty. In the Kamash, Parashishas, Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, 
El Shaddai. This name depicts literally as Shaddai, who is sufficient in granting his mercy, who has sufficient power to give whatever is necessary. Hallelujah. So, El Shaddai and Shaddai is throughout the scriptures many times as a name of God. Highlighting the attributes of the one true God, Yahweh, the most powerful, most sufficient to supply. And the God who is, has the fullness of grace and as a primary part of his nature. See, grace is part of God's nature. And when you look at grace being part of God's nature, that, taint, that changes it. That makes it much more powerful than just uh, uh, unmerited favor. That that just that's like a little tiny bit. That's not even a little tiny bit. That's like a comma part. It's like a it's like a tiny bit part of God's grace. Okay. So if you want to know about grace, you need to start studying the Hebrew Scriptures and find out what grace really means. Grace means a temporary relief from the debt of transgressors, from the debtor or God. Sharing what you do not, sharing what you have with someone who does not deserve to receive it. Hallelujah. Scripture reading, Genesis chapter 27, verse 41, through Genesis chapter 28, verse 22. On his way to Haran, Jacob stopped to rest for the night. Jacob had a dream in which he saw the Lord standing above a stairway reaching into heaven with angels of God who were ascending and descending on it. The Lord God said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The Lord confirmed the covenant he had with Abraham and Isaac he came from that covenant with Jacob. The next morning, Jacob remembered the place by his name in it, Bethel, which means house of God. Beth is house, El is God, so Bethel, house of God. Hallelujah. So whenever somebody invoked that name Bethel, they would knew back in ancient, they would knew that it had to do with the house of God. Hallelujah. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 10 through 15, begin verse 10. Genesis chapter 28, begin in verse 10. Jacob left Bathsheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for a night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones, there he put under his head and laid down to sleep, in which he saw a, stair a stairway resting on earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are laying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out from the west to the east, the north, and the, to the south. And all the people will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his dream, he was afraid and said, This is the house of God. Jacob realized the dream was a vision from the Lord God. Thus Jacob named the place Bethel. When Jacob realized he had an encounter with the Lord God Almighty, he, named, he made a vow to the Lord God Almighty. Jacob was unable to give his tithe as he was several hundred miles from Melchizedek to, give, to pay his tithe. Jacob fulfilled his vow of tithing by giving Esau a tithe of all the animals. Reading from the ancient Hebrew world version. Genesis chapter 28, beginning at verse 16. 
When Jacob awoke from sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Reading from the New International Version, Genesis chapter 28, beginning at verse 18. Early the next morning, Jacob took a stone and placed it under his head and set up a pillar and poured oil on it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If the Lord be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taken and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and all that you give me I will give you a tenth. Hallelujah. The Lord spoke to Jacob to leave. This is after 20 some years of serving Laban. In Padan Haran, the Lord spoke to Jacob to leave and go back to his native land. Jacob perceived the Lord as an angel of God. The Lord God Almighty wanted Jacob to know who was really speaking to him. Thus, the Lord God says, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and made a vow to me. From this time on, Jacob knew the voice of the Lord God into me. The Lord God spoke several other times to Jacob after he returned from Padan Haran. Okay? Now what's interesting is when you study these scriptures, you'll find out that God was leaving and guiding Jacob all the 20 years he was over there at, in Padan Haran at Laban's house, and how to gain the wealth, and so forth, legally. Hallelujah. And God spoke to him, and showed him, in dreams and visions. When you read scriptures, you'll find out. Right now, it's scripture reading. Scripture reading, Genesis chapter 31, verses 1 through 21. Reading from Genesis chapter 31, verses 3 through 9. Then the Lord said, Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and your relatives, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent word to Rachel and Leah to come out to the fields where his flocks were. He said to them, see that your father's attitude toward me is not what it was before. God of my fathers has been with you. Know that I've worked for your father with all my strength. Yet your father has cheated me by changing my wages ten times. However, God has not allowed him to harm me. If he said the speckled ones will be your wages, then the flocks gave birth to speckled ones. If he said the streaked ones will be your wages, then the flocks bore streaked ones. So God has taken away your father's livestock and has given them to me. That's an awesome testimony right there. So Jacob sent for Rachel and Leah. His wives, upon their arrival, Jacob began to tell them how Laban, how their father Laban, had to do a change to an unfriendly attitude toward him. Jacob explained how Laban changes wages ten times, cheating him. And however, the Lord God Almighty had watched over him and protected him from all harm. When God spoke to Jacob, he identified himself as the God of Bethel, where Jacob had anointed the pillar and made a vow to the Lord. Okay? See, God identified himself to Jacob. So Jacob would know exactly who was talking to him, that it was not just some other spirit or an angel or whatever you want to call it, talking to him, leading him the wrong way. God said specifically to God of Bethel. When he said God of Bethel, he knew that was the God who talked to him when he anointed that pillar and sent him the rest of the way here, the rest of the way to where you... Jacob is now, where Jacob had anointed the pillar and made a vow. The Lord God had also provided the flocks for Jacob from Laban's flocks. Rachel and Leah agreed with Jacob and prepared to leave their homeland. Read from Genesis chapter 31, begin verse 11. And the angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob, I answered, here I am. And he said, look up and see all the male goats mating with the flocks are streaked 
speckled and spotted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. Jacob gathered his family's belongings and set out for his father's homeland. After crossing the Euphrates, Jacob and his families headed for the hill country of Gilead, his native land. Seven days after crossing the river, at the place where Jacob set up camp, Laban arrived and set up camp in the same place. Scripture reading, Genesis chapter 31, verses 22 through 42. All right, that night Laban arrived, and God spoke to Laban, saying, Be careful, do not say anything to Jacob, good or bad. However, Laban confronted Jacob about Laban's idols, which were stolen by Rachel, of which neither one of them knew that she was the guilty one. Hallelujah. See? God told him not to say anything good or bad to Jacob. So, all he did was confront him about the idols. All right, Jacob confronted Laban about how Laban cheated Jacob over the last 20 years. And if God had not been with him, Laban would have left Jacob with nothing to show for his work for Laban. It was the fear of Isaac. Another name of God right here. The fear of Isaac. Okay? The fear of Isaac. Jacob's father. The fear of Isaac. And the Lord God Almighty who kept Laban from harming Jacob. All right? The fear of Isaac. That's an interesting name for God. The fear. Oh, yeah. Now let's read in Genesis chapter 31. In 40. One. Reading from the New International Version, Genesis chapter 31, beginning verse 41. It was like this for 20 years I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters, six years for your flocks, and you changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would have surely sent me away empty handed. But God, seeing my hardship and the toil of my hands, and last night he rebuked you. But God has seen my hardship and my toil. Okay, now the fear of Isaac. Really interesting. Now, you got to go back a few chapters here. Because Isaac, <coughs> after Abraham died, let the scriptures say that Abraham passed died, Isaac stayed where Isaac was staying. He went and the king there recognized and the people there recognized that God was with Isaac because of mighty things Isaac was able to do. And Isaac got a blessing of a hundred fold on his crops and animals. He got a hundred fold in one year. Whew. Out of one plant, he got a hundred fold. Hallelujah. So that's a long, his flock increased a hundred times. Hallelujah. And people of that land saw it and they were afraid of him. So they sent Isaac out away from them. And then the king and chief commander goes to Isaac and they say that hey man we see that God's with you we fear God we fear you because we fear you Isaac because God is with you in such a mighty way we want to be part of it we don't want you to attack us and we will not attack you because God is with you and if we attack you we will be destroyed basically that's what they were saying okay now that's the fear of Isaac. All right now, after everything was settled, Laban wanted to make a covenant with Jacob, and Jacob agreed. Laban wanted to serve, and Jacob wanted to serve as a witness between them. Jacob agreed. 
Jacob and Levin set, Levin set up a pillar stone, set up a pile of stone for a marker of the covenant. Laban set up a pillar as a witness between the two of them, and Laban took an oath by the names of his God and the God of Abraham, while Jacob took an oath by the name of the fear of his father Isaac. Took a name. Then there was a sacrifice to seal the covenant and between Laban and Jacob. Scripture reading, Genesis chapter 31, verses 43 through 55. Reading from the F5 version, Genesis chapter 31, beginning 51. And Laban said to Jacob, See this heap and this pillar, which I have set up between you and me. This heap is a witness, this pillar is a witness, that I will not pass this heap to you, and that you will not pass this heap and pillar to, to me to, for harm. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of of their father which is objects of worship Torah it was an idolater judge between us but Jacob swore only by the one true God the dead the dread and the fear of his father Isaac then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat and they ate food and lingered all night on the mountain the next morning Laban went on his way toward his home and Jacob went on his way toward his brother Esau. Jacob saw the angels of God. Jacob said, This place is the camp of God. Thus he named the place Maha, Na, Maha Naim. Maha Naim. Now let's read in Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32, beginning verse 1. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God. So he named the place Mahanaim. Naim. Jacob sent other, sent some of the angels who met him to go to Esau and present to Esau, and to present to Esau the gifts Jacob had was setting, sending with the angels, the messengers. When the angels returned to Jacob, they reported that Esau was coming with 400 men. Reading from the NIV, Genesis chapter 32, beginning in verse 3. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Zir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, This is what you are to say to my master Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with the Laban and have remained there until now. I have cattle and donkey, sheep and goats, men servants and maiden servants. Now I am sending you this message to my Lord, that I may find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to Esau. Now he is coming to meet you, and four hundred men are with him. Jacob stayed the night before crossing the stream at Jabok. At Jabok after sending his family and all his possessions over the stream. That night Jacob wrestled with a man until daylight the man was an angel who struck it. Jacob's hip. When Jacob could not overcome him, Jacob held the man until the man blessed Jacob. The man changed Jacob's name to Israel because Jacob had struggled with God and with man and had overcome. After Jacob had overcome man, the man blessed Jacob there Jacob called the place Anayel because he realized he had seen God face to face. And I was reading scripture reading for this. It's in Genesis chapter 32, verse 22 through 32. Scripture reading, Genesis chapter 32, verse 22 through 31. Reading from the American Standard Version, Genesis chapter 32, beginning at verse 25. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched his touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was strained as he wrestled with him. He said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. 27. And he said to him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, 
thy name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For thou hast striven with God and with man, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Therefore is it that thou doest ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And the sun rose upon him as he passed over Peniel, and he limped on his thigh. After leaving Esau, Jacob traveled to Badan Haran. He bought a plot of ground from the sons of Hamor, a father of Shechem, 400 pieces of silver. There he made camp for all who were with him and his livestock. Jacob built an altar to the Lord God and worshiped the Lord God. Jacob called the altar El Elohe Israel. Sometimes altars built for worship. The Lord God became the name of God. Sometimes the altars built for worshiping God. The Lord God became the name of God. Hallelujah. Let's read how the M5 version, Genesis chapter 33, begin verse 17. Reading from the Amplified Version, Genesis, chapter 33, being in verse 17. But Jacob arrived at Sukkoth and built himself a house and booths for the, and shelter for his livestock. So the name of the place it called Sukkoth, or booths. When Jacob came from Padan Haram, he arrived safely and in peace at the town of Shechem in the land of Canaan, and he pitched his tent there before the enclosed town. Then Jacob bought a piece of land on which he had encamped from the sons of Hamar, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. There he erected an altar and called it El El Elohi Israel, the God, the God of Israel. Altars. Now this is about altars. All right, this is out of the Kamash. Jewish commentary, all right, an altar. Jacob named the altar, the God, the God of Israel, not in a sense of deity. See, when they named their altars, it was not in the sense that the altar, the names of altars are not gods. From the Kamash, altar. Jacob named the altar, God, the God of Israel, not in the sense that it was deity, because he wanted God's praise to be invoked at every mention of the altar's name. The meaning of the altar is, He who is God, the Holy One, the blessed is He, is the God of the person, Jacob, whose name is Israel. By erecting the altar and naming it as he did, Jacob fulfilled the vow he had made 20 years earlier before leaving the land. Jews have always sought to identify God as the author of their salvation triumphs, and Remen notes that names have always been a way to do this. Thus, we find such scriptural names as Zai Zurael, God is my rock, Zuri Shaddai, Shaddai is my rock, Emmanuel, God is with us, and the familiar names of angels with the end E-L, or God, such as Gabriel, Power is God's, and Michael, who is like God. The sense of such names, and of the name of Jacob, gave his altar, is whenever one thinks of them, one is reminded that God is the source of power and blessing. Most believers today think building altars was in the old scriptures, the old covenant. They do not need to build altars to the Lord. Altars were built to remind the person of the encounter with the Lord God. Thus, the altar was named according to the encounter and was meant to be a praise unto the Lord God Almighty. Okay, that's not, they named it. Let's read on. Because he won God, won God's praise to be invoked at every mention of the altar's name. That's the key right there. He wanted God's praised to be invoked 
at just a mention of the altar's name. The meaning of the name, he who is God, who is the God, one who blessed is he. Is God of the person, Jacob, whose name is Israel. By erecting an altar and naming it, as he did, Jacob had filled the vow he had made 22 years earlier before leaving the land. The Jews have always sought to identify God as the author of their salvation and triumphs. Scripture reading, Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 9. Reading from the New Jerusalem Bible, Genesis chapter 22, being in verse 9. When they arrived at the place which Elohim had indicated to him, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood. Then he bound his son, put his son on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of Yahweh called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He replied, Do not raise your hand against the boy, the angel said. Do not harm him, for I know that you fear Elohim. You have not refused me, your own beloved son. Then he looked up, and Abraham saw a ram caught by his horns in a bush. Abraham took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the place Yahweh provides, and hence the saying today, on top of the mountain, Yahweh provides. Jehovah Jireh, as New American Standard Verb, Yahweh provides. There's no J's in Hebrew, so it's more properly pronounced Yehovah Yaira. Abraham called the place Yahweh provides, Yahweh Yaira. Hence, saying today is on top of a mountain, Yahweh provides. Now, in New American Standard, it's Jehovah Jaira, right? But in King James, but in the Hebrew, there's no change, so they've been Jehovah Yaira. The names of God are awesome names. Hallelujah. I got one more lesson in the Bible sheet in the book of Genesis. I think it's one or it might be two more lessons of the names of God. And then we get into some really awesome names again. Because <clears throat> most of the names of God were established back in Genesis in the beginning of our sheet. Okay? And some of them was established in, in a, a Shemot, Exodus. And in the books of Moses, there's a few more names of God that comes along. All through the scriptures, you'll find another name, a new name of God here and there along the way. Because people are wanting to identify where they have an encounter with God. It's a Hebrew. <clears throat> when they had an encounter with God, they made, they set <clears throat> a pillar, an altar, planted a tree. They did something to mark the spot where they had that encounter. And, when they had, and that way, they would always know when they came to that spot, that would remind them of that encounter they had with God. And when they spoke about the name of that altar, or the name of that place, or the name of that tree, it would invoke praise of God upon their lips. Here we are today, we're too big a hurry to stop and say, oh, we have an encounter with God, okay. Thank you, Lord. Off we go running. We don't take time to go forth and give God the praise and continue to praise Him for that encounter. Hallelujah. And if we would build an altar or mark the spot somehow, <clears throat> maybe what we need to do is get a big old picture frame and start writing down the things that God has done in our lives. We had a special encounter with God. We need to write it down in big letters what the encounter was. And so that when we need to know 
when we need to reflect back on what God has done for us, we can go back and find it. All right? Some people write it down in books. Okay? They write it down in the what called journals. They write it down in a journal. Okay? So they write it down in a journal. Good. Hallelujah. Now you take that journal and you go back, and what happens? You go back and you look at that journal. What's going to happen, huh? You need to get this together. Because when you just look into that journal, and you go back and you start reading back through that journal, you'll find a praise of God. You'll have praise and worship in God, and you'll find yourself laying on the floor, praise and worship God. Oh, Lord, how great you are. Hallelujah. And you'll just give Him all the praise and glory for everything He's done in your life. Hallelujah. That's why it's important for us to mark it. We try to mark it down our heads and our minds. I just mark it down my mind. I don't remember. No, you won't remember because there's so much junk going on out here that fills your head so many times that it's hard to keep your mind focused on God unless you make a specific effort to do it. That's the reason it's important to write down your encounters with God. Hallelujah. Sometimes our encounters with God are so divine. Okay? And some of the encounters I had with God when I was after carrying the cross are written down. And, uh, But most of most of them I can remember. And like when I was walking north of Noblesville, out in the country, I was trying to get to the east side of Noblesville, and God told me not to go down this road. I said, well, I don't know where I got to go down this road, because this is how I get to where I'm going to be. He said, don't go down that road. So I got to that road, and I turned, I went down, started down that road. He told me three times. The third time, he said it so loud, that I had, I, yeah, he said, at the end of this road, there's death. Okay, Lord, I turned around and went back. Okay, now he didn't have to say that, he didn't say that first couple times. He was trying to get me to turn around and go back. I wasn't paying, I argued with him. I argued with him about two, three hundred yards down the road. I was arguing with him. He told me twice before that. And then the third time he says, there's death at the end of the road. I turned around and looked. I turned around and started back to the road where I was supposed to be at. There was a super storm coming. Super Thunderhead, one of the great big ones, with all that big, all the rain and wind and lightning coming. Oh, Lord. And so I got back to the road, started down the road, <coughs> uh, county sheriff stopped, deputy stopped. He said, well, if you can't find, there's no place in town for you to go. We have no motels or anything. So when you get in town, you have, if you haven't got a place to stay, you come by and we'll put you up so you can stay out of, out of the weather. Uh, okay, Lord. Okay. So anyway, I, just after he left, a lady stopped that I met earlier. And uh, so anyway, she says, got a place to stay, Thomas? I says, no. She said, well, there's no place to stay in town here. So I said, no, that's what the sheriff just said. She says, okay, well, let me go down here a couple blocks and uh, go to my daughter and son-in-law and see if you can stay there. She went down there and she said, she came out there with a the flashlight. By the time I got down there, she had to have a flashlight to, to flash me because it was so that it was dark. You know, choo -choo. okay. So anyway, I went to stay at that person's house. Hey, there, I didn't stay and sleep inside the house. I slept outside in my tent. But I was protected by a, a fence. It was a strong fence, just a new fence that was strong. I was sleeping in the corner. That fence protected me from the wind and everything. Anyway, it was strong thunderstorms that night. Whew. Man, it was strong. Yeah, it was crackling and thunder and popping and snapping. So anyway, I get to sleep, get peace and go to sleep. I get up the next morning and uh, they come out and get me. I go in and have some breakfast with them. And then I prepare myself to leave. I get uh, head down the road and just walk from their house back to the highway because they live in a uh, wooded area. And just short distance, you know, half a block, three quarters of a block, I don't know, maybe a block, but not very far. I started down the road 
there's limbs two or three inches in diameter laying on the ground. I kept walking and I've seen, I've seen limbs up about six inches in diameter, big ones like this, laying on the ground. You know, they, look, they were all busted off and everything else. I thought, oh, well, thank you, Lord. So anyway, I just thank God for that. And anyway, I left, I, t I turned at the first road, head over to the highway on where I wanted to be, to go down to be on the east side of Noblesville. And down that road, heading toward the highway there, I met a young man, and he gave his heart to Jesus. Hallelujah. Now see, if I would have been at the other place where I wanted to be, I would not have met that man, and he would have missed God. Sometimes we have to allow God to lead and guide us where to go, where not to go, where to stop and why, so forth. And for a lot of years, walking, carrying that cross, I learned a lot of stuff like that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I think that, that was important. See? So, see, that's it. That's in a, I got that written down someplace. And uh, a lot of the years when I walked, when I was working, I was able to get a rope down. Now, in 2001, I didn't get much rope down like I wanted to. Same way with 2002. And I think I got 2001, 2002 pretty much written down. I had a lot of newspaper articles I gathered along the way to help me remember things. And then in 2000. Three, when I walked in uh, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, I don't have a lot of that recorded like I would like to. And then I come back and I go, in 2006, I walked to, from Perigold here to uh, Little Rock. Some of that's recorded. And then when I walked 12 from Perigold here to St. Louis, there's a lot of stuff that happened along the way, and I don't re and I have a hard time remembering it. I don't remember what I got wrote down, what I don't have wrote down, because I was on the road almost continuously. So uh, it's kind of rough sometimes to write everything down like you want. But I, uh, when I got down the end of the day, man, I was too tired to write. So I got up early next morning. I was ready to get going and get on the road and finish up the work that God called me to do that, that year. I just thank you, Lord, for your glory and honor and praise. I just magnify your holy name, for you are worthy of all praise, worthy of all glory, worthy of all honor, and we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of Yeshua, Hamashiach. All books available by Thomas Crosswalker Moore are at Amazon.com. The HTTPS address below is for the web address of the author page at Amazon.com. Also, the books can be viewed and checked out at my web page at CrosswalkerTBM.com. Here are a few slides from my walks from 1981 through 2012. And a total of 17 crusades. Contact information. You can contact me through crosswalkertbm at gmail.com. Please reference the title of the video at the beginning of the message. My web address is crosswalkertbm.com. More information about lessons, books, CDs, DVDs, and even my um, YouTube page.
Uh, you can check out Facebook at Thomas Cross Walker Bud Moore. My author page at Amazon.com is listed below. So, may the Lord bless and keep you all.